We have been in some pretty uh, deep waters lately. The book of Hebrews is a profound book, and it's challenging, both in the sense that it's, it, it, there's a lot there. It's written at a fairly sophisticated level, a nuanced level. There's lots for us to understand. It's challenging in that sense. It's also challenging in the sense that it's full of challenges. And uh, some of these challenges, um, uh, especially those that we've been looking at in chapter 4, are a little bit uh, unsettling. Again, um, my job is not to take any of the sharp elbows away from this. Uh, Jesus says some things that ought to be unnerving. Uh, and lots of people who say that they just think Jesus is a great teacher are clearly not paying attention to everything that Jesus says because he says some things that are very uh, unnerving. And so in Hebrews chapter 4, we have been um, really uh, put on notice, put on edge. Um, some of this stuff has been very unpleasant to read. We've been told that we need to be careful, uh, concerned about our eternal state, that we need to be diligent to make sure that our relationship with God is strong and that we will enter into his rest and that we are not to kid ourselves that, uh, that the word of God is discerning as is God. God can see our hearts. He knows everything about us. So it's been tough sledding. I have good news. <laughs> We're turning a corner. Uh, we start a new section, one that's going to actually work all the way into uh, chapter 10, uh, and more importantly, one that has a very uh, different feel. Martin Luther said, you know, having uh, beat us up, having uh, scared us, uh, having uh, dramatically unsettled us and terrifying us, God now comforts us. And, and Luther says, uh, after pouring wine into our wounds, he now pours in oil. Uh, I'm not sure either of those sound like a great plan, but anyway, I'm living, two thousand well, 500 years after Luther. So um, we're going to be encouraged by, by now turning to Jesus, and we're going to be uh, told that Jesus is not simply the exact representation of God, the radiance of God's glory. You know, he's, he's not just all of those things. We're going to be told uh, that Jesus is our high priest. And for those of us who, are, uh, uh, who don't come to that word from a, perhaps from a Catholic background, may not fully appreciate it. I, uh, I don't claim to be a priest. I'm called a pastor uh, so I, uh, I, you might have noticed, maybe not, but I, when I am uh, officiating at communion, I don't stand in front of the table. I don't stand in front of the elements. I stand behind them. Symbolically, you don't go through me to get to God. Uh, you, uh, you, priests in a Catholic sense are understood to be, as in the Old Testament sense, sort of intermediaries. They represent uh, the people to God. And, uh, and so you go through the priest to get to God. You can, you can go to the priest to confess your sins. Now, people come to me to confess sins, and we're to confess our sins to one another, but it's not in the sense that I can offer uh, forgiveness to you. I can point you, I can lead you, I can pray with you as you go yourself to Jesus, who is our high priest. Um, so all that to say, uh, all that just to say, look, I, I think there's great comfort when we come to understand that Jesus is our high priest and that he lives to make intercession on our behalf and that he is, he is, uh, he is our advocate. Uh, he is our defense attorney. He is the one who represents us to the Father. So there's some really encouraging stuff here as we move uh, now deeper into the book of Hebrews. I want you to be encouraged. Don't want to take the edge off, but I want you to be encouraged that we have Jesus, our high priest. Talk more about that tomorrow. Have a good day.